The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, a husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well and with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Thus far the reading of God's Word this morning. Now, you remember that uh, Pastor Hathaway set the tone for this month-long study, uh, taking his text uh, in Exodus chapter 18, last Lord's Day, dealing with Jethro's counsel to Moses, uh, not to try to carry the entire nation on his back, as Moses had fallen into the habit of doing, but to do, the, do that which is hard for managers, and that's delegating authority. Elders uh, who already were among the people, they were there even before the, the time of the Exodus in the people of Israel, uh, and, uh, but Moses had taken it on himself, and uh, the Holy Spirit through Jethro was telling him to return to that order which allowed for the sharing of those responsibilities among qualified men. Uh, this passage uh, that I want to deal with this morning, of course, is the subject in its entirety of Module 1 of my leadership college. Uh, that's a program that I offered to the session in, way back in 2002 and has become regular practice for us here at 2003, uh, since 2003. But what I have in mind to convey to you this morning will not include a survey of all of these attributes. That's what we study in depth and probably, as the guys would say, uh, ad nauseum. Uh, but uh, just simply to focus on verse 1. Verse 1 begins with uh, Paul saying, this is a trustworthy saying, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, now first let us be, not be confused with the wording there. Overseer is the word that he chooses in that text in many translations. Um, or in, all, in many translations, this word in the Greek, which is episkopos, is translated with the English word bishop. And that, of course, begs the question right off the bat, uh, is there yet another position uh, of authority in the church uh, which uh, uh, is, ranks uh, even over that of elders? Uh, are there to be overseers over the church as well as elders? And the answer to that from Scripture is clearly no. A totally separate office of bishop is never mentioned. It's never described in the New Testament. It clearly does not appear in church history, at least until the third or fourth century, when it was created by a misconception of what the word actually refers to or means. There are three words that you see in the New Testament. One's overseer in, in, in English translations. One is overseer, the other is elder, the other is leader. And they're all words that are used interchangeably in the New Testament to speak of that one duty within the church of spiritual oversight over the church itself, over the people of the church. That, that spiritual oversight is the charge that is given to the elders. Uh, the biblical form of church government is Presbyterian. That comes from the other Greek word, presbuteros, which is often translated elder, and means that same office. And that's where the word Presbyterian comes from. The church is to be ruled by a college of elders, uh, and uh, there, uh, so that uh, there is no room for one particular man in the hierarchy of things to be having his authority and his sway over everything else the church does. But what does it mean for a man to aspire to the office? To aspire 
or to set his heart on that kind of service reveals more than anything else the man's love for his Lord. And therefore, a devotion to the Lord's bride, which is the local visible representation here on earth, follows that. To care enough for the local body of Christ that the man desires to serve in that place is the appropriate meaning of the word aspiring. You cannot help but notice, I think, that aspiring means more than just being willing or being able. Paul has to be our model here, doesn't he? You know, during the three missionary journeys that he took, which fulfilled the Lord's unique calling to him as an apostle, Paul started a string of churches, a string of churches radiating all the way around the uh, Aegean Sea. Paul started that, uh, those, those churches all the way from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. And if, uh, if uh, uh, tradition serves uh, us well, uh, we might even uh, be re aware of the fact that uh, he also may have laid the groundwork for churches as far as Spain. The people in those cities responded well to Paul and to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and each one of those churches would have loved for Paul himself to have stayed with them, uh, to have stayed with them part, uh, particularly and served them as their local pastor. Back before I got my first call, I would be sending out resumes and applications to various churches and was getting, you know, rejections left and right all over the place. And I used to joke about that. I said, well, every committee, every church committee does the same thing. They start with Paul. Is Paul available? Can we call Paul? And if he's not available, then we go down the list and we finally wind up with, okay, let's look at Barker. <laughs> and that's kind of how every, everything goes. But Paul had, all, had been given a larger calling. He had been given a, a, a larger vision than being uh, just the pastor of the local church. He was called to be a, a pioneer. He was called to be a missionary, a church planter. And there's a place for that in the church even today. And the Lord blessed his work, which proved at time to be, if you're in uh, Pastor Kurt's class, you're learning this uh, very well. It, it, at times, it, it became a very arduous thing for Paul to do physically, very demanding on him in every way, shape, and form. And at many times in his life, it put his life at jeopardy to simply plant the church of Christ. But his energy, his preaching, his commitment proved very inspiring to many. He was, uh, he was the, his first partner in missions was Barnabas, and uh, the two of them, uh, you know, went out. Barnabas had originally been a pastor in Antioch, one of the several pastors in Antioch, and uh, Barnabas took it upon himself to go over to Tarsus, where uh, Paul was. In those days, he was just known as Saul, the former Pharisee, but he had been studying the Word of God with the new eyes of the gospel. And Barnabas brought Paul over to Antioch to teach and to preach there. And it was from Antioch that they both were called by God to be missionaries. And to, he, so he recruited Paul for the ministry, and later Paul and Barnabas went together on the mission field. Uh, and after that first mission trip, they split up and they decided to go at it separately, which meant more, twice as much ground could be covered. And by doing so, they're doubling their efforts, which included adding more men to their staff as well. We think we read of Mark, Luke, Tychicus, and others that were added to their missionary endeavors, who were likewise inspired to leave their homes and to go on mission. Uh, it takes an inspiration like that in order to make men do those things. Even if it's short term, it's a great effort, it's a great sacrifice. But when you're caught up by the mission of God and the vision that He gives you, you do it. It's what you seek to do. Uh, and then uh, besides those supportive companions, Paul also picked up uh, two protégés that we know of, probably more, who were set to be pastors of local churches themselves, Timothy and Titus. And so he trained them. He trained them to be local ministers and then left them in their particular places of service so that they could, charging them with sobriety to 
To do what? To preach the Word of God and to raise up elders within the church. That was his primary task. The reason I put you there in Crete, Paul says to Timothy, was to raise up elders within the church, to inspire them to seek the office of leadership in the body of Christ. But all the while that Paul was doing that, Paul understood his own main task and, as church planner was not to find more partners in ministry. They came to him almost naturally. His job was not to build a group of missionaries for a team so that he could go out and in a stronger way. Even, to, even his, his job wasn't even primarily to raise up pastors like Timothy and Titus. They kind of came along naturally. His main priority as church planter was to raise up elders. Raise up elders in all of the churches that he planted and he left in their charge. And likewise, that was his charge to Timothy and Titus. Elders must be pretty important if that's the case. They must be pretty important for the Church of Christ. It's because Paul's unchanging priority here that I've decided, that I've been so persuaded, rather, throughout my ministry to embrace what I call a two-office view. I studied Paul and I came to that conclusion, that the, the Bible teaches a two-office view here. You know what I mean by that? The Church of Christ has long debated how many offices there are in the church? Are there three offices? Are, is there a pastor and an elder and a deacon? Or are there just two? Is it just elder and deacon? And I've long been persuaded that there are only two. Uh, when, whenever someone takes a three-office view, the priority in that person's mind always goes to the minister. He's always raised up in some special way as being more important to the church than her elders. Now, I'll be honest with you. There's times when I'm tempted to be a three office man. I think the elders need to listen to me more than they do. But the point of that bottom line is, is that I have one vote, just like every other elder that sits in the meeting has one vote. I don't get my way all the time. You may think I do, but I don't. I can show you the record of how many times I have not gotten my way. And I'm not bitter about it. But while ministers are important, ministers have the tendency to come and to go. Just when you decide you like a minister, he takes a call somewhere else. And who does he leave you with? The elders. Ministers' effectiveness can be readily measured by how their message is received and acted upon. Okay? My message to you is this. Elders are important for your church. Raising them up should be your priority. And to have men aspiring to office, aspiring to the office, is a blessing from God. So the question here, of course, is, it's everybody's mind, why aspire to such an office as this? Why aspire to that? Or as other translations would put it, why would a man ever set his heart on such a service? The most obvious answer in my mind to that is that such aspiring is not going to happen if all of the men in the church are not first inspired to the very doctrine of the church and what she means to Christ. If they do not first catch a vision for the body of Christ here at New Covenant. This is the motivation I have had for starting up the Leadership College. Rather than the way that the, even the form of government tells us to do, and all of the Presbyterian forms of government do the same thing, they always say, well, open up the floor for nominations, get some nominations, train the men, and then elect them, which leaves the pastor probably maybe two weeks to train the men. 
I wasn't trained in two weeks. I don't know how any elder can be trained in two weeks. Instead of that, I wanted to call all the men of the church, give to them all that vision, give to them all that charge of God to aspire to service in the church of Christ, to grow in the Lord throughout their Christian lives toward those very characteristics that Paul lists here. Seeing, seeing in those qualifications as the very attributes, the very uh, aspects every Christian man is to have, is to grow to have in his own life, whether he serves as an elder or a deacon or not. Christ calls you to grow, men, to grow in all of these practical ways that go against our naturally sinful grain, that require of us things we have to work at. Patience. <laughs> Forget it. Long-suffering. Forget it. All of the fruit of the Spirit goes against our natural order of things. So do the qualifications here, but we're all, every single one of you is called to grow in Christ. That is your duty. That is what God expects of you. Appointing men to these offices before they aspire to them always brings up the question of motivation. Why is the guy standing for election? If a man takes the office when he is not seek it, what's the reason for him doing that? The one motivation Paul stresses here is that the mature Christian man loves the church of Christ, seeks her prosperity in this place, seeks, senses his duty to give himself to her toward this end. And that means that the other motivations which might satisfy others at any given moment should not be seen by the congregation as sufficient in and of themselves to give to a man such a responsibility. One motive that is not appropriate is a personal desire for power or control of the church. I've known men like that. I've known men that simply want to balance the vote, persuade the church to go in the direction he wants it to go. They simply want to be in charge. They simply want the church to become what they want the church to become. The spiritual welfare of the people is secondary. As long as he is comfortable with how things are and where things are going, that is what satisfies him. That is why he wants to serve. That motivation is not acceptable. Politics, personal, cultural preferences, all such self-centered motivations should be excluded. That man's motivation is not appropriate. Another, mo another inappropriate motivation is when a man wishes to enhance his own reputation. You know, we're warned in Scripture against acting out of pride or self-seeking. None of us are to think that we may use the church for our own individualistic advantage, whether that's political or economic or social. Back in the 60s when I was growing up, elders would, men would aspire to the office of elder because that meant they were somebody in the community. The church Christ doesn't have that same kind of recognition anymore, but in those days, it was a temptation for the lawyers and the doctors to want to become elders because it spoke to their reputability and to their advantage. It was advertising for them. It should also be said that being flattered by others into consenting to serve is also an inappropriate motivation. Every communicant member of the church may submit a nomination. You should pray, asking the Lord to show you plainly 
if you are nominated, whether or not you are just being flattered. Aspiring to the responsibility in God's kingdom should never be motivated by a personal compliment. But when a man aspires to the office an overseer of an overseer in the right way, Paul says he desires a noble task. You know, as an adjective, the word noble means showing the qualities of high moral character, such as courage, such as generosity, such as honor. Notice that doesn't describe the man. It describes the task to be courageous, to be generous, and to, ha and, uh, to be honorable. Serving as an officer in the church is doing a noble task. And when the church is dutifully served by her elders, she is blessed and profits greatly from their leadership because that leadership is courageous and generous and honorable. Oh, they will not be perfect, brothers and sisters. They will disappoint you often. But if they're doing the job, you will be blessed. You will be benefited. Any given elder cannot be perfect in his qualifications or how he succeeds in carrying out his duties, you know. But the vision for what an elder should be must not be allowed to be, re to, to be reduced in its description in the eyes of the congregation. Trust the Lord, congregation. Trust the Lord. Do not give in to compromise, thinking that you have no other choices but the guys that are here. Do not be resigned in your thinking that if you do not elect this man, he's going to leave. He's going to just drift away. You've got to put him to work to keep him. And because the office is described this way, it cannot be allowed to be viewed or regarded as a service that is either temporary or materialistic. I know that terms and even term limits to eldership are pragmatic concepts that Christians debate and sometimes favor. Term eldership just seems a little more suitable, thank you. But if a man, listen to me, if a man aspires to serve for only a little while, he does not have, nor will he grow to have, the shepherd's heart that an elder must have. He will only continue to serve out of his willingness to do so. And when his time runs out or his courage wanes, he knows he has an exit. He can give his time and his effort to other things. If a man serves, for example, only to secure the church's financial footing, if a man serves only to get a building built, if a man serves only to get a mission program on its way, he serves with only a short-term mission in mind. The task at hand may be absolutely important to the church. The task at hand may even be critical to the church. It may be in a very crucial moment that the church simply has to have. It may indeed prove to be very invaluable in the long run, but making him an elder for that purpose means he's still not fulfilled this moral task, this noble task. It must not be, it has not been the spiritual growth of the people that has burdened him the most. The elder's authority is spiritual. And it is permanent. Another disciple of Christ who writes to the Church of Asia Minor and who is concerned for their well-being and their care is Peter. And he writes this in 1 Peter chapter 5, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, 
exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Our Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. When one of his flock strays, he secures the 99 and he goes for the one. And he brings it back and returns with him joyfully. That's what a shepherd does. The manager would let him go. The troublesome sheep after all, just let him go. We're better off without him. But a shepherd reaches out and implores and begs and draws that person back, if at all possible, away from his sin, away from his temptation, back into the flow, a fold of Christ. Dealing with sheep, that's the point, brothers and sisters. Dealing with sheep <laughs> is a noble task. But shepherding people is never easy. You know, we're all, we all tend to be messy. We all tend to be chaotic. We can be fickle. We can be short-sighted. We can be thin-skinned. We can continue to sin and we can continue to need correction. But the Lord is our shepherd. And those he calls to the office are his under-shepherds. It is not a task for those who lack courage, who lack the generosity, but it is for those who seek nobility. Taking care of the king's own sons and daughters is his task. And who seek the honor of Christ even in the self-sacrifice that it takes. The elders of God's church must remind themselves continually that it is the Lord they serve. They do not answer to the people. That is another reason why term limits is not appropriate. You, the elders do not answer to you. They answer to God. It is the Lord they serve. And for all eternity, as we read from Revelation 4, it is before the Lord they will represent you in worship. They will continue to lead you in worship forever and ever and ever. The job is permanent. The Lord's reward for them is Himself. And when a man aspires to the office... That's the only thing he wants. Let's pray.